Hey guys, and welcome to the recording of uh, yesterday's talk. So, as you know, yesterday we had a lot of technical problems. So, well, because of that, we both got delayed and uh, needed to switch from Hangouts, which had a, basically a global outage, to Twitch, which uh, both caused a delay for us. And there were some further technical issues on the line with me being disconnected from Twitch. And that's basically why we decided to record this session again, so that uh, for those of you who couldn't watch it because of a delay or because of a laggy stream, well, they can enjoy the show as well. So before I get to the slides, a few words about our hosts. So the host of the show is Garage for Hackers. And uh, well, in 2007, they were basically a group of amateur hackers and uh, they created a community on Orcat. Well, that was in 2007, now it's 2014 and they have a really big forum on garageforhackers.com. And some, uh, well, they are pretty active on the scene. So they have 4,000 users, uh, they participate in the bug bounty programs, including Google, Facebook, Yahoo, and uh, they commonly have uh, the best of uh, bug bounty submissions. They also have a bunch of CVEs in uh, products like Chrome, IE, Firefox, Safari, and so on. And they also do other interesting security stuff. You really should check them out on garageforhackers.com. We would also like to thank our sponsors, which are Hack in the Box Security Con And, well, it's, uh, it's important to note that we are making uh, another conference pretty soon in Amsterdam. It will be the fifth year anniversary conference for Hack in the Box in Europe. And it will feature an all-women keynote, which is, uh, which is pretty amazing, pretty awesome as well. They also have something new in mind this year. It's called the Hack in the Box Hackspo or Hacker Expo. It's basically a three day open to public IT uh, event, which uh, well has several exhibitions for hackers, makers, uh, and I mean, uh, by makers, I mean topics like 3D printing, laser cutting, Arduino, embedded uh, stuff, and so on and so on, uh, as well as uh, some uh, themes will. will uh, be on physical security, for example, well, lock picking and uh, cracking safes. That's uh, that all sounds pretty, pretty amazing, pretty awesome. Uh, all access to Hackspo will be completely free, so be sure to check it out. We would also like to thank our second sponsor, which is Wackspace. So really, thanks guys for supporting this uh, this show. And we would like to thank our media sponsors who made it possible to actually for us to reach the audience, uh, which is you. So uh, we'd like to thank the Hacker News, Hacks in Taiwan, and Hackers Online Club. Really, thank you for supporting it. So again, you can find the um, Garage for Hackers at uh, garageforhackers.com. You can follow uh, them on Twitter, which is uh, at Garage for Hackers. Also. There's a Facebook uh, fan page. Mm, and uh, well, I guess we can jump to the slides. So the name of the presentation is Data, Data, Data. I can't make bricks without clay, which is basically a quote from Sherlock Holmes from one of the novels and the movie as well. Actually, well, this is a kind of a good quote to use for reverse engineering since uh, while you are reverse engineering something you do need a lot of data to understand what's going on and uh, I would like to, to I would like to show you some tricks and tips uh, and give you some tips which basically allow you to both acquire the data and uh, acquire it faster in some cases or analyze the data so First question is, who am I? So my name is Gunvail Coldwind and uh, I'm the, currently the captain of the Dragon Sector CTF team. Uh, I'm also the co-creator of Vexilium, which is a computer enthusiast team. Uh, we, one of the projects we did was uh, visible on the left. It's a, a Syndicate Wars port from DOS 4 GW to modern operating systems. Uh, which required a lot of reverse engineering since we basically, our approach was to uh, reverse engineer the game 
in uh, such a way that we could pinpoint all the input output points and as well as the standard C libraries that were used by them and then switch them to modern um, to modern C library, modern input and output um, APIs without uh, reverse engineering the game logic itself, but uh, with just recompiling it with, uh, with a set of wrappers. Uh, it actually worked and we actually managed to create a version both for Ubuntu or actually Linux, uh, generally uh, Windows and uh, OS X. And uh, well, I'm also uh, working at Google in the security team, I'm an information security engineer. And uh, well, because of that, I in, need to say this, but all opinions expressed during this presentation are mine and mine alone. Uh, it means that these are not the opinions of my lawyer, my barber, uh, and especially not my employer. So again, everything I say, it's, uh, it's my opinion. And uh, well, if you quote me, then please quote me as a private person. So what is this all about? Um, again, I'm going to present some practical tips and tricks to use in daily reverse engineering. Um, there is no single theme and I'm, I will be jumping from topic to topic basically. Each uh, tip will be both on a different level. Some will uh, be more appealing for beginners, some will um, interest probably uh, people who already did some a fair amount of reverse engineering. Uh, that being said, uh, most, most topics and most tips I will use CTF tasks as an ex as examples as well as crack me tasks or similar stuff basically because these tend to exaggerate reverse engineering problem to the limit and if you know how to deal with them you probably can deal with anything that you meet in the real world anyway so I, I think they are um, pretty good examples in, in there in CTF tasks I also assume that the audience knows uh, what IDA is ideally tried to do some reverse engineering in the past. Uh, you can also be like a um, reverse engineering enthusiast that would like uh, to get into the trade but didn't yet uh, manage to do so for, for some reason. So yeah, basically enjoy the show. Okay, so tip number one is if assembly is hard for you, then try translating it to C. What, what exactly do I mean? So Let's assume that we have code that looks like this. This is actually taken from the Hypercube task from the Boston Key Party CTF from a couple of weeks ago. And it was an optimize me challenge, which means that you were given an application, you needed to understand how it works and find the spots that were really, really slow. And well, optimize it in such a way, and by optimizing, I do mean binary patching, that, uh, that it, well, begin to run faster and actually calculated the flag because what was calculated was the flag and because it was done really, really slow, it would take years and years to calculate. But when you optimize it, it generated the flag really, really quickly. So you needed to understand the task and uh, the problem was that the application was in PowerPC and I actually don't speak PowerPC too well, which means I had to have a manual open and uh, work with the manual all the time. And I must admit that uh, opcodes like MFCR or XRWI don't tell too much uh, to me. So when, well, basically with experience, you can, uh, in, in different assemblies, you can basically look at the code and s s uh, instantly say, well, this does this or that. Uh, that being said, this, co this code that I'm looking at tells nothing to me. So. What I normally do in such cases, and also in cases of like complicated x86 code, is I try to translate it into C or pseudo C or whatever language which looks like C. Uh, why C? Because I'm most, most familiar with it and it's quite good for playing with low level stuff as well. So as you can see, like there, is, there, uh, there, is, sorry, there is a lot of opcodes here, especially in the second group, but they only uh, form one C instruction, one C line. So if you translate every opcode, every mnemonic to something meaningful, meaningful in C, you get, well, C code, which you can easily read, easily work with. It's, uh, 
way easier to read this code and to understand what's going on than read 100 lines of PowerPC assembly, which uh, you are seeing for the first time. And uh, one big uh, gain from this, like almost by accident, is that if you are careful enough, you can compile this code. And if you can compile this code, it means it will run natively. And if you need to brute force something, for example, if you are verifying that a hash function uh, is uh, not collidable in a really easy way, or if you are verifying that uh, some crypto algorithm and want to crack it, then, well, you get a code that you can run in basically on any operating system you have on your fastest machine. So that's pretty good as well. And a kind of smaller tip here. So as you can see on the left, especially the names I picked for the, uh, well, basically for, for all the labels are names of fruits like grapes, apples, pears, and so on. This is because I'm not really, uh, I don't kind of dislike the ad addresses, uh, based labels like log underscore some address because if you if you have like 20 of them they get mixed up really quickly so what i tend to do is i tend to rename them if uh, in the important parts of the code to for example fruit names or color names and uh, they are much more distinguishable than well that being said the code kind of looks like a fruit salad but yeah <laughs> it's still workable with Okay, the next tip is trace things. Basically, so um, let's uh, let's maybe bef before I jump to the uh, to explaining what tracing is, uh, let's look at this example. On the right side, we have uh, shaker.exe. This is a crack me I was uh, solving in 2007, I think. It was created by Bartosz Wojcik, uh, and it's basically one megabyte a uh, one megabyte file which you can see on the right side uh, a piece of its disassembly but uh, trust me that the whole file looks like this so when you focus on the arrow which are well mostly on the middle of a screen you can see that uh, there are a lot of jumps which like jump uh, from one location to another sometimes jump forward sometimes jump backward they uh, kind of overlap sometimes it's it's really hard to read and uh, Please be reminded that there is one megabyte of this kind of code, which makes it totally unreadable. And if you want to focus on the algorithm that is inside, well, this, this just won't do. And uh, a normal disassembler won't work here. So here comes tracing, basically. Uh, tracing is running the application step by step, or basic block by basic block, be depends on what approach you are using. But uh, in this case, step by step and recording all instructions and perhaps also all the register values. So what you end up in the end is uh, basically a list of mm, a list of opcodes. Let me maybe show you an example from uh, from this uh, from the shaker. Okay, so this is uh, what the output looks like. This is an actually actually an output from GDB. I'm going to show you the script in a moment. Mm, let me maybe do it now. But what you see is instructions which I which are run in the order that the CPU actually had executed them, which is the important part. So the script looks like this, and it's really really short as well because as you can see, most of it is setting up GDB stuff, then well creating some constants. And after that, just uh, running in a loop until single stepping, basically SI is single step in, um, sorry, single step instruction in GDB, and printing out the instruction which is on the given EIP until EIP reaches the breakpoint. So basically, in two steps, it creates a list of a huge list of instructions from one point until it reaches the second point. Now, I actually, when I did it, I was still using Windows 98 or something like that. So maybe it wasn't 2007, maybe it was a little earlier, but it was something like that. That being said, I actually needed to use a application that captured the console to store this 
for some reason I my D GDB didn't like to save history back then. I don't remember why why it was that. So back to the topic. Of course you're you're not going to read this because this is still unreadable, right? Jump 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 jump. It tells you nothing. So what you want to do is you want to use regular expressions and first remove every second line, remove all the jumps, every line that has a jump inside. And what you get, you get something like this. So this is without removing the the white lines, uh, the empty lines yet, but you can see the, the instructions which are left basically in the position they were in the first log. So you remove the blank lines as well, and what you get is this. Let's maybe go to the beginning. And, well, this is c a code you can work with. You, there is some obfuscation still left here. Basically, for example, this sequence basically doesn't do a lot. Well, maybe it does something. But again, this is a code you can work with. You can, there's not a lot of it. There's uh, just a couple of hundred lines. And uh, actually, remember, this is a trace listing. So each loop got unrolled. That being said, it's something you can analyze. And basically, this allowed me to solve a shaker crack me back then. If you would like to play with some obfuscations created by the uh, offer of, of uh, Shaker 2, uh, basically you can go to plog.com products slash obfuscator and use this code to um, obfuscate your assembly code and try to see what exact tricks did he use there. And another note, some debuggers do have tracing as a separate option. You don't need to create uh, a script to do it. For example, OLDDBG, I'm pretty sure it has it. I, I think I used it once or twice. There is both a tracing window and uh, an option in, in, in the menu. So, uh, well, take a look if you're an OLE user. Try to be familiar with it. It sometimes comes uh, really useful. And another thing I wanted to touch on was uh, RAR VM. So uh, RAR is the archiver you probably well know. Uh, and it actually has an emulator inside of it. So this was, I think, created because of backward compatibility. So uh, a RAR archive could have a bytecode which decompresses the code using some, for example, old algorithm or whatever. And even if RAR didn't support it, uh, the new RAR didn't support it, he, it could still run the bytecode, which would decompress the thing anyway. So that's actually pretty cool. Uh, that being said, a couple of uh, years ago, I think it was like two years ago or three years ago, Tavis or Mandy started to analyze this and uh, posted an assembler to create uh, programs in this bytecode. Now, uh, what happened then was it got picked up by the CTF community and sometimes on the CTF you do end up with a RAR VM task, uh, which means it's a crack me that looks like a RAR file, but you actually need to analyze the RAR bytecode and based on, well, whatever it's going on, try to get the flag. Now, uh, there was this CTF task on Demoa CTF last year, it was uh, reverse engineering for 200 points, which means it wasn't too difficult. Which, uh, well, I first thing I did was download this RAR VM disassembler, which actually is UNRAR, the open source UNRAR, but uh, modified in a way to dump, at the beginning of a program, to dump everything. It didn't dump anything for this crack me for some reason. So what I ended up doing is I modified the modified version of UNRAR to uh, well, I'm actually going to show you how I modified it because uh, it was a really simple change. Um, okay, let me just find it. Here it is. And here we go. So on the right side, there is the original disassembler. As you can see, there is the dump code um, line. It's before the emulator, uh, before the virtual machine execution loop. So at the beginning, it just dumps the code. Now, I moved this inside the loop. This is basically the only important change here. And uh, the rest of are just printing some additional information. And what, uh, what I, sorry, I also dump only one instruction. Instead, instead of everything, I dump one instruction. And what I get from it is basically I get a trace the listing. And it turned out to be a really good move. Let me maybe show you uh, exactly how it um, behaves. Okay. So I have this, UNRAR is basically this uh, patched and patched again, uh, 
trace uh, this assembler in this case, and I can run this um, the task. And as you can see, the trace showed me exactly what got executed. And in this case, well, what got executed was a flag. And uh, this is exactly what I was looking for. So it moved to register zero, some things. For some reason, this, the disassembler couldn't dump it. Uh, maybe because it uh, did a jump and between the jump and, uh, well, whatever is between the jump and this address, there was uh, some code which mixed stuff up for the normal disassembler. However, a trace disassembler did the job and in the end it allowed me to find this flag. So, again, tracing, remember about this technique and use it when, when needed. Okay, so for the third tip, keep your information source close. And by close, I do mean nearby and not closed, because, well, it's, it works better open. So, uh, this time as an example, I'm going to use the ZBin 500. It was basically the most uh, difficult task, reverse engineering task on Olympic CTF Sochi this year. And uh, it was difficult because it was uh, it wasn't x86, it was IBM S390, which I know nothing about, and IDA didn't support it, which makes made things even more funny. So what we had to rely on, we had to rely on object dump to, and it's disassembly. And the disassembly looked like, well, this on the lower right on part of the screen. Uh, I don't know about you, but opcodes like DLGR or LLGFR or maybe LA tell me nothing. Well, LA may be something like load address, but I have no idea. Uh, so I needed to, again, jump frequently to the manual. Now, this isn't something you want to do all the time, like uh, jumping to the manual, because it takes time. I mean, if there is... If, there is like 100 different instructions and you spend one minute looking in the manual for each instruction, uh, then, well, it's counterproductive, right? So instead what I did is I found this opcode list, right? It's a, basically a list where there is an opcode and a mnemonic with some explanation, like add normalized long or add unnormalized long or branch and link. And then I fed it to my Python script, which is called make readable. It opened this, uh, well, the opcode list I showed you before. I, I think, I mean, in the internet, you should be able to find opcode lists like that in the similar format, like a parsable format for most like, architectures. Uh, so I loaded this file and I created this ops di uh, dictionary. Then I parsed it a little to basically get the opcode or um, the, I, I actually the mnemonic. And, well, I put the description into the dictionary. When I loaded my disassembled file, so this is exactly the thing you see on the screen here, on, on the lower part, and for each line I looked if the given opcode is in my dictionary, and if it was in my dictionary, then I did put inside the line a description of this. Of this instruction. So the result of it, and by the way, I am going to share the source code for this, so don't worry. Uh, you, you don't have to like write down the source code or anything like that. Um, basically, what I get was something like this. Uh, we actually can even make it a little more readable. Um, let's just turn on syntax coloring, and this is gonna okay. Yeah, and as you can see, there are still the strange looking. Uh, opcodes, and well, strange for me because I actually do most of reverse engineering on x86, but I also get the descriptions. So I don't have to like alt tab to see the manual all the time or like move my head to see the manual opened on the second monitor, look for the given opcode in it. I have like the information ready and waiting. And uh, this actually speeded up the reversing really, really a lot. So it's a small tip. It's, it's nothing really technical, but it's uh, good to remember it as well. Okay, so the next tip is be prepared to make your own tools. And actually, this section is uh, not going to be about uh, debugger scripting, but it's going to be about, uh, well, how to create your own debugger and how a debugger works. That being said, uh, well, 
after the presentation yesterday, you did ask me if it's uh, really important to know how to create a debugger. And uh, actually, sometimes you need to know that, but I think a better tip is to focus on scripting. That being said, I'm still going to go through this section. Uh, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, sometimes the debugger we use are, or the disassemblers we use are not, not really, they don't really do what we want them to do, or they are too noisy, or they, uh, well, do something that is easily detectable and we know we can bypass it, uh, and we don't know, don't need the whole functionality of a full-blown debugger in a given case. Mm. So that's one thing, and the other thing is you actually do get to appreciate how a debugger works if you know the internals and mm, well it's a uh, good to know how something works because thanks to that you can use it in a better way so the first thing i'm going to talk about is uh, disassembly engines so basically it's a library or a function which you feed it some well basically bytes an array of bytes a blob of bytes and it outputs the uh, instructions. It doesn't care about any headers, it doesn't know about anything like like uh, file headers, execution headers or whatever, but it uh, it can take opcodes and output a mnemonic form or a structure which you can use to uh, interact with them. Personal favorite is this, this term. Uh, this term, it's open source, it's uh, well developed for a long, long time and it's really, really awesome. It also has bindings for most of the scripting languages, uh, as well as, uh, of course, C++ and C. So, example of usages, when would you use a disassembly engines? Uh, actually, I'm going to, to say when I did use the disassembly engines. So, first of all, I meant, did mention the Syndicate Wars project, right? And, uh, well, we did have to create disassemblers back then. Um, basically, uh, well, Anevald was the one who coded it, so big kudos to him what uh, what the question is why i mean um so we needed to do it for two reasons first of all the original syndicate wars file was uh, a dos for uh, gw executable which I, I think it's called linear executable which is a kind of a, a spin-off of uh, the dos executables but uh, well the other disassemblers we had didn't really like this kind of format so that's one thing. And the other thing is that since our approach, we needed to be able to recompile the source code. And that basically means that, well, you know, these assemblers don't really care about outputting code which can be recompiled. And uh, we needed something that we can feed directly without any changes to the assembler and we would get an object file. So basically because of that, we had to create our own disassemblers. Um, Another thing is, uh, it's an important part for custom emulators. If you are writing an emulator, like a really custom, really small emulator to emulate, I don't know, some function, then probably you want to have a disassembly engine nearby, unless you can, uh, it's like a really, really small disassembler, sorry, emulator, which you can actually implement your own mini disassembler without too much effort. And normally it's, it's a huge effort if you want to do a full-blown library. So it's good to use the already existing ones. That being said, if you want to know how an opcode is coded, totally do it, totally learn about it, because it's uh, it's good to know that. Okay, um, another thing, a custom ROP gadget finder. So uh, first, a quick explanation what's ROP. ROP is return-oriented programming, and basically it boils down to a to security and to creating shell codes or payloads that uh, try to reuse pieces of code which are already in the memory, already in the libraries, already in the binary. Uh, each of such piece needs to end with, with a red instruction because what you do basically on the stack, on the programming stack, uh, sorry, program stack, you put uh, using, uh, well, because there is some bug, you put a list of return addresses. So you return to a piece of code and it executes and it then returns to the next piece of code you said it to return to. And, um, okay, so normally I'm going to show you an example of ROP. Mm. Okay, here it is. So basically these are called gadgets and uh, 
well, they consist of a couple of instructions and after them there is a red address. So you, you return to this address, uh, you put it on the stack, then you put some other address, for example, this one on the stack, though this one makes little sense. So let's, uh, well, okay, these aren't the best uh, gadgets I have seen. Uh, so basically you put something on the stack, then it executes this instruction, this instruction, this instruction, and does a return to the next address on the which you put on the stack. Uh, apart from some other parameters that you might need to put on the stack. Uh, that being said, uh, thanks to this, you can actually create a program which which does anything you want, or in case of Rob, usually anything that a pen tester or an, an attacker wants. Uh, this is a really cool technique, by the way. Uh, it's, uh, it's fairly common in modern applications. You do really need to know it and use it. Uh, that being said, uh, there are also a lot of Rob gadget finders. So why would I need to create my own? So actually the task was called, um, I, I was doing this for, was called Mixer. And the idea was that while uh, I, I could use gadgets from the C library that were found in the memory of the C library, I couldn't really use all of them. I could only use ones which were really close to certain functions. For example, let's take printf. I could use gadgets which were basically um, 100 bytes before or were 100 bytes after printf due to the constraints I had. And well, if I wanted to look for the gadgets, I couldn't, I, I well, I couldn't use an existing group gadget finder because they were scanning the whole file and that gave me nothing. I needed gadgets which were, were only gadgets which were close by and not to, you know, search for them in the file. So, uh, especially that every gadget finder basically tries to unicize, unicize the, well, show only the unique uh, gadgets, which means they wouldn't probably show the gadgets nearby anyway, because similar gadgets would be found somewhere earlier in the file, uh, which boiled down to creating a simple gadget finder which is actually not, not, it's not really long. It's actually really short. So it looks like this. Um, it's again, Python. Well, as, as you can see, there's a lot of Python. Python is a good thing to know when you are both reverse engineering and into security. Uh, so it starts here. I just opened, uh, in this case, it was the C library. Uh, then I had some address, like for example, this address. And then I, well, starting from, um, so this is the address of, of some function. Let's say this is the address of printf, right? Uh, and then starting from 0, 0 at this place to ff at this place, so basically this is only the only region that interests me, I decoded um, 10 bytes, well, at that exact address, right? Now, I decoded it using this decode as 64-bit function, which actually just calls this term decode uh, you give it the address it is at, so it knows uh, what address is to display. You give it the, uh, well, the bytes, this is the 10 bytes from that given offset. And then you tell it in what mode do you want the code to be decoded. And you want it to be decoded in 64-bit. And uh, that's it. That's it. That's the whole interaction with this library. You basically get a list of uh, addresses, mnemonics, and... Um, I, I just format them in any way I wanted, and if there was a red found, a red found, sorry, and there were no DBs, then I would um, check if they are in the unique table and finally output them. And uh, well, this is the kind of output this function, um, sorry, this, uh, this program generates. So it's what, it's 50 lines, but it allowed me to really quickly do what I was supposed to do, and in this case, find gadgets which were nearby. Okay, and another example would be an aid to IDA Pro, which is kind of funny. So, okay, basically, uh, this was another CTF task, and uh, I think it was ca called Byte Sexual. It was on the Ghost in the Shell code CTF this year, if I'm not mistaken. And I was presented basically with this code at some point of the task. Now, as you can see, especially in the place I marked with the red uh, circle or ellipse, actually, well, it um, the visco doesn't make sense. I mean, who'd ever put into ESP ECX register, especially w what is this decrementing ECX going on all the time? Like, who does it? So I have no idea what visco does, right? Uh, this, this just doesn't make sense. It doesn't look totally bad, but it doesn't make sense. So. What I ended up discovering is that sometimes the application did jump into 64-bit segments. And basically, 
So basically it started to execute the same code, but in 64-bit mode. So this 32-bit application uh, was disassembled as 32-bit, but I actually needed it, needed it to be disassembled partially in 64 bits. So what I ended up doing is I ended up again using this term, uh, this time with IDA Python, and creating a script which would, uh, I would point it to a start location and it would traverse uh, downwards until finding, while well, returning to 32-bit, and comment each set of uh, bytes with basically um, 64-bit assembly or disassembling actually of these bytes. So this is the same code. This is uh, what you're seeing, exactly the same code that was on the previous slide, uh, exactly the same area, but in 64-bit. And as, as you can see, this does make sense. I mean, um, there is no move RSP ECX. It was actually R12. And well, because of uh, encodings kind of match, uh, we got something similar, but there was also a decrement, if you remember it correctly. It was well seemed to be a piece of mm, the next opcode after all. Well, this makes sense, this I could work with. So one thing I did realize afterwards, or actually was told afterwards, is that I, in IDA I could create segments which were, uh, and tell that this segment is 64-bit, or this segment is 32-bit, and the, this way I could disassemble, uh, well, I, I wouldn't have to use this term to disassemble uh, these parts, but being said, some functions in uh, in this application were run both in 64-bit mode and in 32-bit mode. And I needed to know everything that they do in both modes. So uh, using this approach, I could actually see the code in, well, in both versions all the time. Okay, uh, going further and uh, please, know I'm, please note I'm not going to go into the details. This is uh, uh, this and the next section is actually food for thought. So if you are interested in how debuggers work, you probably want to, uh, well, to note these functions, put them in Google, find them on MSDN and uh, read about them, try to play with them. I'm, again, I'm not going to go into the details and this is just uh, just that you know these functions exist and uh, what, what are the basic building blocks of a debugger. So, uh, well, most of the uh, reverse engineering happens on Windows anyway, and that's why I'm going to talk only about the debug API for Windows. And um, I'm also going to, to talk about some CPU x86 CPU specific debugging features that it has. First of all, and most important part is reading from memory, which you can do using the read process memory and virtual query AX files. Um, it's uh, basically useful to uh, read the content of the memory. Uh, if you, for example, want to read from a given application, just want to read some value, some global variable, which is on a given location, you can read it. Or you can do it, uh, do like a whole memory dump of the whole memory space of the application. I actually developed an application called Hyperdrop, which does exactly that. And uh, it's open source. You can you can look through the code, look how it works, looks look how it's uh, done. It's uh, sometimes useful to just like dump the whole memory and play with that or uh, look for strings inside of it or similar, uh, similar things, the similar things with it. Well, another API you would like to know is write process memory. Basically, it does the opposite. Instead of reading the process memory, you put something in the process address space. Using this uh, function, you can actually like overwrite pieces of code. So install hooks, you can put your own code inside and um, it's, it's or change the values of some variables. It's generally really useful to, to know how to use it. It comes in handy. Okay, the other useful tools is uh, virtual protect X and virtual alloc, which allows you to basically allocate uh, memory inside the different processes address space as well as change the access rights to pages on in that other process. Uh, create remote thread, which means you can create your own thread, which, for example, points to the, well, starts executing the code, which you placed there before uh, using write process memory, and uh, inside of a, of an application you are reversing. This is uh, sometimes really useful. To create a debugger, usually you use uh, to start basically the debugging process, you do a create process, which is a standard API to run an application on Windows as you do, but using the parameter called debug process, 
or the back active process to attach to a process which you know the PID of, like process, process identifier. Um, and the, the main loop of the debugger consists of the two latter functions, which is wait for the debug event and continue the debug event. One of them basically waits for some event to happen, for example, a breakpoint or loading a library or ending a thread. And uh, then you, you as a debugger get notified about it and uh, can analyze it. And in the end, you do uh, what after whatever action you take, you do just continue the back event and the application keeps rolling. Uh, you can do context manipulation. And by context, I do mean registers. You can change the values, query the values, uh, useful stuff. Now, I'm not going to show you this demo because for some technical reasons, uh, my code, which I had written, I think, eight years ago or so, doesn't work on Windows 7. So I do need to look into it and I'm probably going to post some explanation what, what went wrong. Uh, this demo didn't work yesterday anyway. Okay. And... Uh, well, the last thing I wanted to uh, talk about... Uh, related to how debuggers work is it's good to know the debugging features of your platform. Um, you, some of this knowledge you do use frequently, other knowledge you just, uh, it's something you keep in your mind and wait for this really special project, one special project who, once in the lifetime where we, you will use it. Uh, that being said, it's still good to know about it. So first of all, an important thing, CC is the software breakpoint. This is int3. It basically uh, generates generates um, uh, well the third interrupt, uh, which is uh, the debugger interrupt. And uh, uh, so basically, the software breakpoints work like this, that some instruction in the given application is replaced by this opcode, replaced by this opcode, yeah. Um, this is important to note. Uh, it's, it's I, I think, the most useful thing here. Um, then you can do single stepping using the trap flag. Basically, you set the trap flag in the flags register, and the next instruction will generate a, a breakpoint, actually a single step breakpoint. Then you can do branch stepping using the same flag, but you can tweak its behavior, and you can uh, get a breakpoint only, um, or actually an interrupt in this case, only on basic blocks, on the, only on the boundaries of basic blocks. Uh, then there are hardware breakpoints, which means you don't actually replace the code with something that generates a breakpoint, but you do feed an address uh, into a register, and when the CPU hits that address, uh, you can define if it's uh, a code execution uh, on that address, if it's reading that address, is it, is it writing to that address, then an interrupt happens at the, and basically you get a breakpoint. Uh, then you can do memory breakpoints. Uh, basically, it's uh, <laughs> well, it isn't really a memory breakpoint. Uh, what you do is you well, this allow access to a given page of memory that you are interested in, and uh, when the application tries to interact with this page, it will hit uh, well access violation mm, exception basically, which the debugger will get notified, and this basically means it's just a memory breakpoint. You can also do uh, branch tracing using branch trace store. This is a pretty new functionality in Intel CPUs. Uh, AMD recently, and by recently, I do mean five years ago, it was discovered, but M AMD has some additional range uh, memory breakpoint functionality in hidden uh, MSR, undocumented MSR registers, and so on and so on. Basically, it's good to know this, uh, this stuff, but that being said, you do normally just need to remember that CC is in free, and that's whereas this uh, for sorry for the one special project. Okay, and the last thing I wanted to uh, say in this part, and I mean this part because I'm going to split the recording into two parts. Um, I want to uh, tell you about well x86 running on x86, which is kind of obvious, right? Well. Uh, what I really mean here is that if code was generated, for example, for, for Linux, it's a Linux application, you can still run it on Windows uh, or the other way around. Or, for example, if you have a DOS 4GW application, which, like Syndicate Wars, you can run it still on Windows, on 32-bit Windows. Um, but, uh, well, there are some dependencies which you do need to take care of, and you do need to take care of a proper memory layout uh, and some probably some other things as well. But uh, let me show you what I'm exactly talking about. So let's look into IDA. 
as you can see, I do have uh, some Linux application. Um, it's called a out. And well, it has some kind of a hash function. You actually feed it the input, uh, which can be, a, as you can see, a string, probably a zero ter terminated string since there is no length associated with it. And apart from that, um, well, it could also use a constant length, but that's, that's uh, not really important here. In the end, it does call printf and displays the hash for it. So it doesn't return the hash, it just displays it on the screen. Now, there are sometimes scenarios where you are, again, testing a hash function or some encryption algorithm where you do want to generate a lot of values. And um, I'm actually using a VM, a virtual machine for Linux. So doing this kind of things on Linux is slow uh, for me, personally for me, right? Uh, I would like to do it on Windows. Now, as you can see, there are not really many dependencies, like external dependencies for this function. It's mostly same self-contained. Uh, there is this printf, which is one dependency. Um, then there is this uh, string here, which is another dependency. And I think that's about it, actually. So that's a really good situation. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a, an application. I actually already have it created, which looks like this. And what it does, it allocates 64 kilobytes of memory at a nearby location to this. Actually, uh, I'm storing the pointer address and I'm displaying it here for the back purposes. This is because uh, Windows probably is not going to allocate this address, it's going to allocate uh, an address which has zero in this exact spot um, due to how, how memory management works on, on Windows. Um, that's another reason why I'm allocating 64 kilobytes even though, though the application is really, really small and it could easily fit into 8 kilobytes, I think. That being said, I do open, uh, after that, I do open the application. Sorry, this is the A out uh, file again. Uh, read binary because I'm on Windows, of course. And I do read under this address, um, well, 64 k kilobytes. Of course, there is no 64 kilobytes in this file because again, it's eight kilobytes only, but it will successfully read eight kilobytes and that's everything I'm interested in. Now, as far as uh, taking care of um, memory layout goes. Mm, let's maybe move this, move it aside. Uh, you can note here, well, the address is 08048 and there 300 E4, right? Now, on the lower left part of the screen, uh, you do see the file offset and you can see that the file offset actually matches, perfectly matches this address. It's also 3E4. This means that if I put this function on address starting like this, uh, 080444, sorry, uh, 08048000, then, uh, well, this function will land exactly on this offset. So, as far as memory layout goes for this function, everything is okay. That being said, I don't think the function uses uh, non relative addressing anyway, but it's good a good thing to take care of anyway. And then it uses this the string. Well, this string is on a different address. 520. It's again 8520. And you can see the string will in the file is on the same exact offset, so it will be in memory in the exact same place, which is good. So I don't need to worry about the string. What is left is the printf function. Now, um, it jumps into, it calls actually into this uh, thing, which is on 8300. And again, as far as 300 goes, it's on the exactly same offset in the file. And it does read the offset from memory from this location. This is, of course, the got PLT section. And this is normally where the dynamic loader would put the address of printf function. Now, um, this is in the file in a different location because, uh, well, AOO should be on like 2000, on the offset 2000, that being said, it's on the offset 1000, so there's some mis uh, mismatch here, but I don't care about it because I don't care about the real printf address anyway. Uh, what I do care is uh, I do care about putting my address there. Now, I'm not going to put the printf address there because I don't care about printing this. Uh, well, I care a little, but, but uh, uh, that's not the point. Uh, I do get, uh, care about getting the final hash, and since the hash is uh, going to be displayed using this argument, that means that if the format is here, then in EDX I will have uh, 
or actually in the second parameter of printf, I will have the hash, and this is what I'm interested in. So on this address, which again, the address is in the, uh, sorry, yeah, on this address, and again, this address is on the um, got plt. Well, I can um, I can uh, put the address of my function there. So when it, this function calls printf, or at least it thinks it calls printf, it will actually call my fetch the result function. Now, fetch the result function um, is like this. It just like has two arguments. It doesn't completely care about the first one. It's the format for the printf, right? For the original printf, we don't care about it. What we do care about it is the second argument, which is the hash. And uh, well, I actually just print it anyway but using my format, so yeah, it's better, it's a better format. <laughs> okay, um, and then the last thing I do is actually, if I go back here a little, is I, I create a function pointer in C, uh, this is why C is wonderful, because you can do such stuff, and uh, well, I assign this address to it. Basically, it means that hash function is on this address. Uh, this is the exact same address you can see in IDA here on the uh, upper left uh, corner of the screen. And then I'm going to call it for two arguments, like hash ASDF and hash XYZ to prove that it's working. So let me open a console. Okay, here it is. And I'm going to run it. Well, since I uh, compiled it using GCC, it's called just a exa. Uh, not a out, of course. And it did print some hashes. It didn't crash. It did work. Uh, as you can see, the address here is, uh, is different. It's, it doesn't have the 8 here, as I told you, it won't have. Um, now, let, let's test if the uh, application actually generates the same hashes on Linux as it does on this uh, hacked Windows version. So I'm going to open a window, sorry, a Linux console. Mm, okay, here it is. And I'm going to run this application, it's called aout, and it actually takes in the first parameter of a hash, uh, sorry, the string to generate the hash out of. So it's going to be ASDF in the first case, and as you can see, it does indeed match. Now the second uh, case was uh, XYZ. Okay, so let's run it for XYZ as well. And it works. So basically, as you can see, I just like um, loaded the file into the memory and used part of Linux code, which was already there, uh, or actually code generated for Linux, which was already there, it did some mm, swapping of, well, first of all, making sure that it's on, everything is in the right location, then I swapped printf address with address of my function, and I, in the end, did call this function directly, because um, the calling convention does match here, it's CDECL. Now, another thing which you might need to take care of is preserving the registers. I mean, on Windows and on Linux, probably the calling convention says that there are different scratch registers and um, some of them you might need to preserve on Windows that are normally preserved on Linux uh, or the other way around. Or sometimes, for example, if Linux treats some register as a scratch register, um, but the Windows calling convention says that uh, this is a preserved register, then you don't need to care about it anyway. It will work. In this case, it it works, which is which is good. Uh, it might be luck, but uh, anyway, I use this uh, technique from time to time. It's uh, sometimes really, really useful. Okay, let's close everything. So we actually used a really similar approach in, uh, while porting Syndicate Wars. Mm, that said, we did use basically reassembling instead of just loading the image into the memory, uh, but it could be done that way as well, I think. Um, if you want to read about it, then uh, you can check out the video we did talk about it on Recon 2010, I think, with Anavout. You can check the video on, just look for on my blog for Syndicate Wars or Swars, and you will find the link to the video. It's like a one hour presentation, basically, on the technical details about it. I also have another blog post with, well, technical details on how it uh how it works, but in a readable form instead of a presentation. But being said, the presentation has a lot of more information in it. Okay, let's get on with the show. So, the next tip. GDB is your friend, even if you date only debugger or any other debugger. And, uh, well, 
What the thing I would like to point out here is that GDB, which is the GNU debugger, works on basically any modern operating system and that includes both Linux-based operating systems as Windows, as OS X, and so on and so on, which means uh, you can learn one tool and use it on many platforms and many architectures, which is uh, really the awesome part here. It also works with uh, so-called GDB stubs, basically some emulators, and by some emulators I mean, for example, QEMU, uh, which, uh, well, allows you to emulate both x86 and PowerPC as, and as uh, 900, uh, sorry, as uh, 390 and other systems. Well, they have so-called GDB stops. Uh, that means that you can uh, launch the emulator and then connect with GDB to it, and you can you basically have a kernel level debugger or actually a CPU level debugger, and you can, well, analyze and interact with whatever is the target running inside. Another interesting thing here is that QEMU also have something like a QEMU user, which allows you to basically run only one application in a user mode application, which usually needs to be compiled for Linux and you need to do it on Linux. You can run that application um, and debug it at the same time with uh, GDB, even if the application is for a different ar architecture, which is uh, pretty awesome and pretty useful. Now. Uh, the most important part here for me is that GDB is actually scriptable in Python. So GDB script is okay, it's, uh, it's in my opinion way better than Windback script, uh, that being said it's not so great uh, in comparison to Python, but f from a couple of versions you can script it in Python as well, which is uh, amazing and I'm going to show you some uh, Python scripts uh, as well during this presentation, as you probably had already noticed. Um, Okay, and well, it needs to be said that GDB isn't really suited for anti-reverse engineering tricks. It's it's really easy to detect and uh, it has little defenses against anything that tries to detect it, so no lag there. Uh, still, it's good for most of the targets. So about the GDB scripting in Python, basically it's enabled by default in most uh, of the binary versions of GDB you can get. If it's not, you can recompile it. The GDB is really easy to re recompile. It doesn't have a lot of dependencies, just a few. Mm, it, the API is parf partly Python specific, and but most of the things you do is actually you, you do something like gdb.execute and you enter a GDB comment which get exec gets uh, executed. And the other thing here is uh, I think a gdb.evaluate expression or something similar which allows you to enter an expression which gets evaluated and this is useful for reading the values of registers and so on. I'm going to show a few examples of scripts later on. Uh, also commonly it's, it's uh, really great to s be able to script debuggers because they save you a lot of time and a lot of work and sometimes basically make well debugging and reversing possible at all. One example I would like to give is the Turututu Okaml Crack Me from PH Days qualification round in this year. It, it took place a couple of uh, weeks ago. Basically, well, it was an, an Okaml compiled to an ELF executable if uh, my memory doesn't fail me. And the problem is that everything, like all the strings that you put in, into the application, you gave the application, were stored as lists and also pro processed as lists. And it wasn't a list of chars, it was basically a list of chars that were multiplied by two and one was added to them for some reason. And as you know, a list basically is a piece of data which is a one letter in this case and it's uh, also a pointer to the next element. So if you want to manually read a string, you'd have to do a lot of fetching and typing and so on. Basically, you'd have to both read one character, then bring it into um, something that looks like a char and you can actually output. Then you would need to get the next pointer and follow with the next letter from that. Uh, this is, uh, well, it's not something you would like to do manually, so I actually created a script for this, which you can see on the screen. The key parts are marked in bold and with a little bigger font. Uh, basically, it's, it's really simple. So I just uh, gave it an address of a string of the beginning of a list, and then in the while loop, so until r was equal, was equal to one, and r is actually the address, um, one, I don't know, I, it seems Ocaml doesn't use like a null pointer, it uses a one pointer, well, you know, it's a strange animal. Uh, or it may, might have been crack me specific as well. 
so you end up with uh, well you do an uh, expression as int is basically my function which passes whatever expression i give here and uh, uh, to gdb and then converts it to a void pointer if i remember correctly and converts it to a python integer based on that um so uh, yeah i took an item from that address uh, i then pa paste uh, passed it sorry to mod function which uh, basically divided it by two and uh, print out the item and then i move to the next element and this is uh, done again by fetching the address from whatever r r sorry it points to this is all done in the loop so it allows me to traverse the and basically the whole list and the output looks like this so as you can see um well this is a string and it's displayed in a readable form uh, it uh, misaligned a little on the presentation but uh, yeah uh, i don't think we have to worry about it but it's pretty much uh, visible anyway uh, and h r sorry h a t r and d that's something you can work with uh, especially if you get it printed all at once and you have to just type one comment or do it automatically on a breakpoint because this is a script so you can like extend the script anyway um so this is i think a really good example where when scripts come in uh, useful and save the day and in, in this task basically when solving this task the printing out the list was really important and key part here basically i'm talking about gdb but it doesn't have to be gdb of course because uh, well most of the debuggers and uh, reverse engineering toolkits uh, or, or tools actually have python scripting for some reason uh, so windbug for example has a plugin which allows python scripting and it makes windbug really usable then uh, in terms of a script of course uh, immunity debugger has python scripting as well even ida has uh, python scripting so which which i already uh, showed you before an example of so i think as a reverse engineer it's good to know python and it's good to be aware that you can script tools and uh, be somewhat fluent in trying to well in, in scripting the tools it comes in useful so the next tip goes like this in some cases it's a job for an insider and what do i mean by that let's assume and this is actually an example from hacker challenge from 2007 i think from my approach to it uh, basically if you have a binary which is uh, well does some unpacking which uh, normally reverse engineered uh, stuff on windows seems to do uh, but apart from that there is also a heavy debugger detection basically like uses all the tricks from the book to detect any debugger that comes nearby and if you like attach the debugger the application just like exits and says like no way you are not going to analyze me so uh, what what you want to reach in this scenario is basically try for example to dump or just debug or attach the debugger at the moment of well the real application is already in the memory it's unpacked in the memory and uh, well to do that my approach looks uh, looked like this and i use it in a couple of uh, basically challenges reverse engineering challenges and it works pretty well uh, what you do is at the end of the file in this case it was a pe executable file so the last section was i think a resource section i gave it attributes to be executable readable and writable and i put some code at the end the code basically was supposed to break something uh, but not 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 at this moment yet but to uh, so modify the environment that after uh, the unpacking executes then something crashes uh, i didn't care what kind of an exception it could be i could like misalign the stack a little or put an int free or cc opcode somewhere uh, in the code where for example when i knew that the unpacker is already returning and uh, well uh, you basically redirect the entry point to that code that code then set setups or tweaks the environment a little and jumps into the normal code like original entry point then the unpacking code runs and it crashes at certain point when the real application is already unpacked in the memory now because there, there was no debugger that uh, sorry attached but windows allows you to define so-called jit just in time debugger which means that if some application crashes the system operating system is going to run this debugger and automatically attach it to the application so basically we well attached the debugger to the application and the application never had the chance to try to detect it because we well attached it at just the right moment or it got actually automatically attached so 
at this moment, we can, for example, dump the memory of the application and uh, analyze it uh, with unpacked version, which already gives us something to work on. Or uh, actually, in my case, I sometimes uh, the, the break something uh, here instead of just crashing, I would jump into more of my code, which would, for example, set up uh, more breakpoints here. And by breakpoints, I mean, again, the debugger is not attached, but if the application crashes, then the debugger which at will attach automatically. So this allows you to um, work from the inside uh, on the application and to do stuff that will basically allow you to analyze it and attach the debugger at certain points, not all the time, but at certain points, even though the application is heavily uh, protected against it. So actually, before I jump into this topic, for the next topic, I will share my report from the Hacker Challenge uh, in 2008, which I also did use this technique in. So Hacker Challenge was actually a reverse engineering competition held annually from 2006 to 2008, with the last round, I think, was in 2009. Um, um, my reports did, I, I think, pretty, pretty well overall. So... The insider is uh, the insider technique is described, I think, in yeah here in the patch mechanism section, and there's also the full source code that I used to to create the patch in one of the appendixes. Let me just go through it. Yeah, in that the patch section, uh, I also have a note on. Well, I also used the similar technique in the uh, third round of this, which is also described in in the patch mechanism section. And again, the code is also at the end of the report. So look under the YouTube video, mm, and sorry, in the video uh, YouTube video description for the links to where you can find these reports if you are interested in this, of course. So let's talk about PyMay, Stalker, or similar tools. So what what's this? So actually, PyMay is a reverse engineering toolkit created a couple of years ago by Pedram Amini, uh, the guy from openrce.org, the site you probably well know if you're into reverse engineering. And, and one of the tools in this was the Stalker. So it was a really awesome tool which you use in the cases where you have a huge application like take, for example, Internet Explorer, and you want to pinpoint what piece of code is responsible for what functionality. For example, you want to load a BMP file, uh, so you want to pinpoint the code which is responsible for parsing BMP files. Let's assume for a moment that uh, Internet Explorer actually has the BMP parser inside of it. So what you do in such case, you actually um, attach a debugger, or actually this tool did it automatically, and, sets, uh, and set breakpoints on all of the functions or basic blocks, depending on what um, what granularity do you want to achieve. And then you run, well, the application, in this case, uh, let it be Internet Explorer as an example, and uh, you do everything except what you want to find. So you, like, browse around, load all kinds of files except BMP format, and so on and so on. And what it does, it stores a list of breakpoints that were hit, list of places that, well, do not load BMP files. Now, you turn it off and you do a second run. Now, in the second run, you do only the minimum amount of interaction that is required to load a BMP file. Uh, it doesn't have to be like absolute minimum, but the, the least actions you can take, the better. And this is also logged into a separate database. And now the idea is that everything that is in the second database but is not found in the first database, it's probably the thing you're looking for. Now, let's uh, let's maybe look at an example. So I have this Windows Calculator application command line. It's basically, you know, the basic program almost every beginner programmer writes. Uh, well, you choose an operation and you give it some numbers and it displays the result. Pretty basic, right? Now let's assume that we want to pinpoint the exact place where the division operator is implemented. This is the only thing we are interested in. Now I'm going to use actually a really, really simple GDB script to achieve it. So, um, but before I jump to the script, what you need to do is you need to go into IDA. Mm. And actually what you are interested 
in is the function window list. Because I'm doing this on function level granularity, I do not care about basic blocks at this moment. So what you do, you just select everything, copy it, and open uh, some editor. Let's, uh, let's maybe, I'll call the file asdf. I paste it, and now the idea is that you need to bring everything to look like, uh, well, basically you need to strip the front of each line, strip the end of the line, and in my case I want to add the name of a function here, which is setbp for me, um, and log as the name of a function. I do, do it for all the other lines. Of course, this can be done easily with a regular expression, so you don't have to do it manually, uh, but uh, in the end what you want to achieve is a list of uh, breakpoints on functions. Okay, now once you have it, you paste it into your script. Now my script looks like this. So this is the breakpoints I got from this file. Um, and uh, well, I'm going to share the script as well, but it, it, it's basically a really, really, really simple GDB script. It uh, registers one breakpoint handle uh, handler, sorry, which uh, basically has a dictionary and depending on what EAP is hit, it calls a given function. Well, in this case, this is the log function. So if this breakpoint is hit, it calls the log function. Now the log function, function and the only thing interested, interesting, sorry, interesting here is the, um, well, this part, it opens a file, creates a new file called in. Actually, at the beginning, we want to filter out an uninteresting stuff, so out uh, .eaps. And the function itself just writes the EIP to the file. So in the end, we get a list of all the breakpoints that were hit, which are not interesting. And uh, well, now I just run it. So uh, GTB, um, so it's a batch. I'm going to run it in the batch uh, mode, which means it it is supposed to exit as soon as the script finishes. And I want to ex execute my uh, sorry, GDB monitor script on ccc.exe. Uh, now let me maybe move it a little. Here, okay. So as you can see, even before this uh, this part uh, here, the choosing part choosing part is uh, displayed. There were already a couple of breakpoints hit. Now everything is recorded. I don't need to worry about it. Now what I want to do is I want to do everything which is not related to division because division is what I'm looking for. So I do everything that is not related to it. So I'm going to do addition. I'm going to do subtraction. I'm going to do multiplication. And I'm going to quit. I'm not going to do the division. Now the processes exit normally. It's a good thing to hear. And it has created the out AIPs file, which as you can see is basically a list of AIPs. Now I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to change the name of the file to in. And I'm going to run it again. And I'm now in this run, I'm going to do only the exact things that are necessary to do the division. So I'm going to call the division function uh, using well slash and give it some numbers and quit. Nothing more. Now again, it has created another list of the functions. And now what I'm going to use is I'm going to use uh, another Python script, uh, which I'm also going to share. It's called in out. And this script, uh, well, it's, it's pretty simple. It basically loads both the files into dictionaries and then for each uh, sorry, for each EIP, which is in the second file, if it is in, in the first file as well, then do nothing, otherwise print it. And I'm going to run it, uh, run the script, it's called in out again. And as you can see, it printed out only one EIP. So this might be the division, let's check. Uh, I have this file opened in IDA. Let's go to this specific address. And well, I'm already there. Uh, Let's uh, look at it in hex race. And well, as you can see, this is in fact the division function. So I was able to basically pinpoint exact location where this handler is. Now, depending on the size of the application, you might get some false positives because some, I don't know, some timer thread hit by accident in the exact moment. Uh, well, well, sorry, hit only during the second run, but didn't hit during the first run and so on and so on. But uh, usually this is a great method to pinpoint the exact locations of the things you want to reverse engineer. Okay. And uh, I just want to reiterate that all the sources that I'm showing here 
will be shared and look for the link for them in the description of the YouTube video that we are going to uh, to publish. Okay, the next part is monitoring the environment. What does this mean? Basically, it means use tools like uh, S-Trace, L-Trace, Process Monitor, and so on. So Process Monitor is actually a tool from SysInternals, which is Microsoft, and it works under Windows. The other tools are, well, tools that work on Linux. Other operating systems have similar tools. Basically, um, well, I can show how, how do they look like. So, for example, this is the process monitor. What you want to define here is you define a process filter, and in this case I pasted that it's supposed to monitor calc.exe. And I want to have all the register activity. I don't want to have file activity, for, though I might want to have it. Not, I don't care about network activity, but I do care about uh, process activity. You can also have like profiling events and such. So I'm going to start it in, uh, in on my second screen. And as you can see, it fills with with all sorts of events. First, the process started, the main thread was created, then the image were loaded, the DLL started to get loading, loaded, and register keys accessed, and so on and so on. Uh, basically, it's pretty good to sometimes uh, just look on the information about the interaction of the process you're debugging with the environment. Now let's do an example for, for S-Trace and L-Trace. So you remember the hash calculating application I did show in the previous tips, which is this one that you just pasted an argument and it displays the hash. Now S-Trace shows all the syscalls. Uh, so it's S trace just the application and the argument unless you want to trace for something specific and it displays you all the sys system calls that are called with the parameters. This is uh, sometimes really really useful. Now um, for example once something was written into stdout then it's basically a syscall to write to one which is the stdout descriptor and whatever was the argument and its length. Now. The second thing is uh, L-Trace, which is, uh, let's maybe clear the screen. L-Trace is basically, um, it traces the calls to dynamic libraries. So in this case, it will be, uh, well, I guess the C library, which is, yeah, printf call in this case and libc C start main. Now, on Windows, there are similar applications, and I guess you can, you can easily find them. That being said, uh, it's good to know these tools is good to sometimes uh, use them. They are pretty handy. Okay, the next thing is something I learned painfully during different, well, reverse engineering different uh, Linux applications. So another tip is know how to deal with uh, Linux, basically. So the obvious things. Well, obviously Linux is not one system. It's uh, basically, there are a lot of distributions. There is like Ubuntu, Fedora, Red Hat, uh, Debian, Arc Linux, and so on and so on. So they, they also care a little about compatibility between them in terms of binary compatibility. Um, well, it's an open source world. I mean, wh why do I care about binary compatibility if you can just recompile something, right? Well, uh, the less obvious thing is that actually the dynamic elf loader, which is responsible for loading all the dynamic libraries, is not a part of the kernel. It's basically a part of the standard C library, in this case GNU C library, which is pretty funny. Now, um, as a case study, I'm going to show you my dealings with the mixer task on RU CTF uh, qualifications. It was basically the, um, the task where you, which you had to actually exploit, but before you know, before you can get to all the uh, good stuff with exploitation and creating shellcodes, you actually need to reverse engineer it to find the bug. So uh, this was the vulnerability 500 task. And what you got was basically a single dynamically linked binary. And uh, that's it. And uh, my first goal was to be able to debug it. Uh, well, that's uh, to, to, you know, to aid the analysis. So when running it, I got an error, like um, error while loading shared libraries, which basically means I was missing some SO libraries. So if you're not familiar with Linux, SO library is basically the same as DLLs on Windows. Um, but uh, basically, I think, so there's a term called uh, DLL hell, which uh, basically it's a, 
it means that the design of DLL handling on Windows it's not the greatest uh, that being set on Linux it, it's similar so so hell now uh, of course I need to find this library and uh, well the problem is that Google told me that there is this library, uh, this binary of the library, because I am looking for the binary, I don't care about compiling it, on Arc Linux and on Fedora 20. Well, I'm actually a Ubuntu user, and this version of the library is not available for Ubuntu. So, at least for my version, or Google didn't display it. So what I need to do now, I needed to do, and it's good to know this, that you can do these things, is uh, there are two options. You, well, you need to get the library, which is obvious, and you need to get Olive all of its dependencies as well and other dependencies that Mixer could have. Option number one is you just install whatever the, um, whatever the distribution you suspect is uh, will have these libraries in whatever version it is uh, required. Uh, you, you can do it, do it easily on virtual machines which are pretty popular nowadays. You can also ask your friends, maybe they have it already. Um, then, well, I run Mixer on it. In that case, in this case, my friend actually, who had an Arc Linux installed, ran it. And he used the LDD, which basically displays all the dependencies of a given file. So it's not a dependency tree, it's just dependencies of this file. Uh, but based on that, you can create a list of all the SO files that you need to have to run the application. Um, so you actually can use a script to do the last two points to like create a tree instead of a list of dependencies and copy them into the one directory. Now option two is actually uh, which I used in another task while doing another task is you just find the RPMs or dep files online and extract them. So 7-zip turned out to be a really great tool to extract basically every weird archive type that uh, the packages might uh, consist of. Um, and uh, well, it, it's a little more more tricky to find the exact RPM or depth file you need to download, but it's doable using some googling. I'm not going to go into that. You can you again do LDD to check the dependencies for the things you already have, if you already satisfy them, or if you need to download some more packages. And well, if you don't, then you just repeat the steps. Now, in the end, what I did, I got a package of all the libraries and I placed them in the directory called uh, mixer underscore libs. And, uh, well, uh, the loader on Linux, actually, the dynamic loader has a couple of interesting LD uh, variables, LD preload being one which you totally should check out if you have never played with it, because it allows you to easily hook dynamically import APIs, which is really awesome. Um, that being said, I'm going to use another one, which is LD library path, which basically tells the linker where to look first for the libraries. Uh, let's try it. So, well, I did the, set the LD library path to the mixer underscore lips uh, directory, and I run mixer. And as you can see, it didn't work too well, as in I didn't get any problems with the libraries, but the dynamic loader was really, really unhappy with what's going on with, with this file. So based on experience, I already knew what to do in this case. And what you do is, uh, well, you need to have the right dynamic loader, because as I said, the dynamic loader is part of the, it's not part of the kernel, it's part of a uh, GNU C library. And uh, different systems, different distributions might have different and different versions of these distribution, sorry, these distributions might have different loaders. You can check the loader we're using read elf dash. This is small l. This is not one. It's small l and the name of the executable. And just look for requesting program interpreter, and you have the name. So basically, what happens is when the kernel executes an l file, it looks exactly for this uh, this line and it loads this interpreter and tells the interpreter to run your L file instead of the kernel. Uh, unless there is no interpreter, then the kernel just runs it. Now, um, again, you get this interpreter from Arc or from Fedora in this case, uh, I think it was Arc, using the same methods. And you run it again. So we again set the library path and then we run the interpreter directly. We don't run uh, the application. We run the interpreter and, sorry, the loader actually, well, almost the same thing in this case, which uh, takes the application name and the parameter and it's going to load it and start it. 
Now, the errors that show up are actually errors of that application. So that means that the application is running correctly, it's it loaded correctly, and the code begin to execute, which is exactly what I wanted to achieve, which is great. That means it's, it's, it works. Now, let's try to set up some um, breakpoints in GDB. So first of all, what, do, what are we going to debug? We are not going to debug the application directly, we're going to debug the loader. So GDB with the loader. And then we are going to run it with dash dash library path, which is basically the same as setting the Aldi library path uh, environment variable. Mm. And with, with again the library, sorry, the binary at the end. So I'm going to run it, um, and, and this works by the way. But setting up breakpoints doesn't. So if I try to set up some breakpoints, uh, I get cannot insert breakpoint one, error access memory, sorry, error accessing memory, at address blah blah blah, input output error. Now, what's the problem? I mean, the problem is that the elf, the file, the binary which I want to set the breakpoints in is not yet in the memory, because at the beginning of the application, well, the loader is in the memory, but the loader still needs to load the application, but it does it after running. So at the beginning of the bugging, I cannot set breakpoints, which is, uh, well, not what I want, right? So, uh, there are two options. First, I can just attach when the application is already running, but I will probably miss some of the uh, interesting uh, things which happen at the beginning of the application, which um, I might want to analyze as well, right? So I actually developed a different scheme. I basically open the file in IDA, look for the start symbol, and uh, look at the offset in the file, and put a breakpoint there, like CC, CC or CC in this case would just work, right? Now, what's going to happen? When I'm going to start the application inside the debugger, it's going to, of course, crash. And by crash, I mean it's going to issue a, issue a sick trap um, a signal. And the breakpoint is going to catch it. Uh, it's similar to the insider um, technique, but this time you actually have the debugger already attached. And, well, this means that you have just breakpointed at the beginning of the uh, binary you want to debug. So you can, it's already in the memory, you can set up the breakpoints then. You also need to remember to fix the environment. And, uh, well, this is, this is usually done just by, you know, incrementing EIP and in this case emulating this instruction, which is setting the EBP or actually RBP register to zero. And, uh, well, I, I've done it using these two um, GDB instructions. And then I can set breakpoints and continue. And as you can see, it actually did work. Actually, my breakpoint did hit. Uh, it looks a little bothersome at the beginning, but actually, once you once you get used to this technique, you, you do it really fast, really naturally. You don't have to uh, well it, it, worry about it. Next tip: sometimes just be lazy. Sometimes just like skip analyzing thing and be lazy. What do I exactly mean? In some cases, uh, these are kind of, well, they aren't rare cases, but they do happen. Um, you have some kind of a black box, which you normally would have to analyze, but uh, you know that the black box takes some input arguments and it, well, outputs some output arguments. And you aren't really interested in how it works. What you are interested in in is, for example, all the output arguments, in case the input space is rather small, for example, you know, 16 bits or something. Um, or you might want to know what's the mapping between the in and the out argument. Now, um, if in has enough small space, and again, 30, uh, sorry, 16 bits is okay, a little more might be harder depending on the case, uh, to be honest. So uh, I'm going to show you two examples on what exactly I mean. So first example was from the mixer, again, from the same mixer task. You had some functions, actually what I'm showing is only a piece of the function, which had taken some constants which I could kind of change, but I knew that the constants I have are good, and another argument which was again 16-bit in this case, or actually 16-bit that um, makes sense in this case. Now, uh, I knew the output, which is marked here with the red circle, was, uh, well, the point where the output was stored. So as you can see, it's the AX register being stored, that means the output is also 16-bit. So mm, what I did in the end was I uh, basically, well, uh, created a GDB script again, um, and 
the script put a breakpoint here and I recorded all the all the things that are happening here, but I also like I mean all the values of the AX in this particular case. Now I also driven the input so that uh, the input of this of this function always had the argument I know. It was actually from zero to ff ff. So like one by one by one by one. And I recorded the output for everything. Now I'm going to show you um, what, what did the output look like. Okay, so basically the output was like this. Now um, this was actually a sound generating function called so, um, and uh, I had a couple of constants, but I also changed the frequency. Everything here is the frequency, and I started with frequency one, and I went down to. I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure that's not the frequency. I'm pretty sure that's the amplitude. Yeah, and uh, as you can see, like basically the mapping is one to one, but at the end of a function it actually beginning began to change. So if uh, this was my input, this was my output. So in the end, I actually got a huge file with all the possible values. I also did it for another set of constants. And this allowed me to achieve my goal, uh, my goal, which in my case was, I wanted to know what input value do I need to achieve a given output value. And well, having these two files uh, and which basically were in the end a Python dictionary, I could do just that without analyzing this function. So I'm uh, uh, another mark. I'm also showing uh, only showing here a part of this function. This function was a little larger, not not a whole lot of larger, but a little larger. Uh, and uh, well, you could easily analyze it in 15 minutes, but actually I coded the script 10 minutes in 10 minutes. So yeah, it was faster. Now. Uh, Five minute difference doesn't make isn't a too big difference. Uh, a little more difference in the same approach uh, was in the case of uh, Binaflon, uh, which was at reverse engineering for hundred tasks on Sochi CTF. And again, the input was a sixteen bit key. So sixteen bits are it's a small space. It's again sixty five thousand um, cases basically, and the output was a decrypted bitmap. So yeah, basically like this. Now, uh, what I did is I did a memory dump of everything. I pinpointed where is the decryption going on, and I placed a key uh, well in the place it was supposed to be, and then ran all the decryption inside an emulator. So this task was actually on a, a ZX Spectrum crack me. So I ran it on Z80 emulator, which was written in Python, and well, the emulator decrypted it for the given key, and then I changed the key and did it again. And I was storing the this uh, variable, uh, sorry, the output bitmap and the input key as well all the time. And in the end, I actually got the decrypted bitmap, which looked correctly. Now I'm not going to actually go into the demo here because if you look on my YouTube channel, there is this uh, Ginvales and CTF Benaflon for uh, for hundred video, which goes into details of how this task was solved, including how the, um, how did this approach exactly, how did I code exactly this approach. So another tip, do not trust your own tools. And uh, well, most of the time you can trust them, but there are some rare cases where you cannot. So first of all, uh, and this is important to keep in mind, a software breakpoint, as I have already told you, is a CC in case of x86 put inside the code section, which means some piece of the code was changed. Now, if actually you, if actually this piece of code was treated as data, then the data well was also changed, and the result of the application might be different. Now, actually the it is a rare case, but it happens sometimes that you running the application under the debugger with some breakpoints set, you get different results than um, if you uh, if you do the same without the debugger of uh, without the breakpoint, then this might be the answer. Something might be reading the breakpoint, and the problem is that the debuggers commonly don't show you in in the data view. They don't show you the breakpoint set, so they will show you the original data view instead of the CC, which is really there in the memory if you have set the breakpoint. And you need to remember about it. Now, the other thing is that the compilers, which are getting really popular nowadays. So some time ago, I was um, working with a Flash application, and I was using, uh, I think, Sofing uh, decompiler, which by, by the way is a really great decompiler. And this is like one of the really, really few bugs I have found in it 
and uh, it wasn't a huge problem in the end anyway. But uh, it, there was some allowed domains array and well, there was basically this line which tells you nothing about what what's actually happening here. It just says like the reference allowed domains and do nothing with it. And then it was used. So I figured out that, hey, actually some data must be well appended to this array here because otherwise this doesn't make sense. So I fed the code into a different decompiler and uh, well, it actually showed me the correct code, which uh, well, there were two domains there which uh, did make sense. This all started to make sense. So in case you doubt that the code makes sense, be sure to take a look at it from a different perspective. In this case, I use a different decompiler. In case of IDAS decompiler, you can look at the assembly level of the code. Um, it's similar with assemblers, I mean, sorry, with disassemblers. Sometimes the disassembler might uh, be tricked into displaying the wrong opcode uh, or like just doesn't know the opcode. So look at it in a different disassembler as well. Just remember to double check everything you have doubts on. And we're almost done. So a few tips uh, as, uh, well, to, to take along with you. First of all, know your own tools. I kind of failed to do that, but uh, I realized that it's sometimes good to like spend an evening and play with all the different options that the tool has, because you sometimes might uncover really, really awesome, um, well, options which can really help you and speed up the reverse engineering process. Um, use the right tool for the right job, which means uh, well, for example, if you have a decompiler, then probably you want to use a decompiler instead of a disassembler because it speeds up the things. Um, also, also, this means that you probably should know different tools and be able to route, run, sorry, run and write your own tools. Uh, well, because then you can better match the tool uh, that will allow you to do the given job faster. For example, reverse engineering something in this case. Now. Another thing is that some, I, I don't think like anyone who is really into reverse engineering has a problem with it, but I know some uh, people who were interested in it got kind of disappointed that at some moment they had a huge list of code and didn't, there weren't any obvious things what to do with it. Now, so you basically had to really dig into the assembly, which is a bother, some process. Don't be afraid to do that. I mean, reverse engineering at the end is a really time consuming process and don't be afraid to give it the time it needs. So spending a few hours of like translating uh, complicated assembly code into C or into your own notes, uh, well, that's the thing we do, right? Another set of tips. So entropy is good. It's a good recon reconnaissance tool. Basically, entropy is the uh, let's say measure of randomness or measure of chaos. It uh, on, on the right here, you can see a chart and the, each line of the chart, each, each column of the chart is basically 256 bytes of a file. Now, uh, the higher the entropy is the, uh, a higher probability that something there is encrypted or random or um, it might be like a set of uh, just, you know, constants which were generated by some random uh, number generator. Basically, it allows you to, it also, sorry, shows the compressed data. So it allows you to pinpoint the places in the file that might hide something interesting that was encrypted or compressed. It helps uh, a lot. It also shows uh, where in the entropy is basically zero. It shows the areas which are in the file which are totally not interesting. The rest of the things are probably code or data which is also a good thing to know where in the file they are. Um, work from inside, I already told you about this. Then, um, did, I, did I mention that you probably should be able to code to properly reverse engineer stuff? Well, uh, at the beginning, you don't need to. Of course, uh, you have enough of, uh, well, to do like learning basics of assembly and so on. But in the end, first of all, you need to know how to write, write your own scripts and tools in some cases. And second of all, well, you are basically reverse engineering programs. So it's best to know how the programs are created to better understand how to reverse engineer them. And the last two things, um, symbols and signatures uh, help and speed up the reverse engineering process. So basically it means that if you have a file, which is like a huge statically compiled C file, 
or ex uh, in this case an executable file, then you probably want to apply some signatures which de detect the standard C functions and standard functions from different libraries because, uh, well, you won't end up, I don't know, reverse engineering something which ends up to be just printf, right? You want to know that this is printf and not really dive into its code. So uh, look at Flare, which is uh, basically the addition to IDA to allow, uh, that allows creating and using uh, signatures. It is really great. Um, and uh, also look for symbols if you are debugging some, for example, open source binaries or, for example, binaries of companies which do, in fact, release debug symbols. For example, Microsoft does it for a lot of uh, its DLLs. Also, another and the last point here is instrument emulators. And by this, I mean, well, just look at our Boxbone paper or look at, again, the Binathlon 400 video at YouTube that I have on my channel. It basically explains exactly what I mean by instrument emulators. And uh, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, actually, this is a little out of date since this is a rare recording of a video. So if you have any questions, then you can feel free to email me or just leave the question under the video on YouTube. And uh, again, I would like to thank uh, both our sponsors and, uh, well, Garage for Hackers for hosting this. And, uh, well, I would like to again apologize for, for the technical issues we had. Uh, because of that, I guess you guys really need to watch it now instead of well, watching it then because, because I, I really recognize that it required a lot of patience and time to uh, <laughs> to actually watch it when we had all the technical problems. So um, I guess that's it. Uh, you can again reach out to me on gunvale at coldwind.pl. You can check out my blog at gunvale.coldwind.pl uh, or follow me on Twitter, which is just uh, gunvale. So thanks for watching and happy reverse engineering.